Polyvagal theory is a theory of how the nervous system works that is somewhat controversial. But when we look at the framework from a psychological level, it actually begins to make sense. Today on Ask Dr. Gill, I want to talk about polyvagal theory and how it fits into your anxiety. So much, thank you so much for joining me today. I am trying a new way of doing the podcast, which is I'm also doing a video podcast as well. Simul, it's like a simulcast. And uh, so I have slides. If you want to go on to uh, YouTube, you can check those out. Uh, the video will not be on my website because it's just too big to put on there. But the audio will be there if you want to listen to it. And, and I'm going to try and make it understandable, even if you want to just listen to this. So uh, I also stay tuned because I'll have an announcement at the end about, about uh, a new course that I'm offering. And some of this that I'm going to talk about today is actually in the course, though I'll, I'm, it's in a different format, slightly different format and so forth, and uh, a different context. So let's talk briefly about polyvagal theory. And to understand it, we need to look at what the autonomic nervous system is doing. Because there's basically two different uh, forms of what's happening. So before I jump into that, though, I do want to mention polyvagal theory comes out of the work of a gentleman named Dr. Stephen Porges. I believe he's at North Carolina University or was there. And the idea was, is an extension of how the body's tone works. And part of this comes about from research or and, and also clinical experience where you kind of see someone who looks like they're amped up, but they're, they're not able to act. And to understand this, it's important, and I do think this is important in terms of treating mental health because, and, and physical health as well, because I think that what happens is, is people get into a state where they're locked in and they don't know why, and they don't even understand that they're in that state. So let's take a look at the branches here so we can kind of understand this. So when we look at the autonomic nervous system, what we see is that there's basically two branches to it. There's the accelerator and there's the brakes. And the, the accelerator is the sympathetic nervous system. So this is where you have the ability to run or to fight. It's fight or flight. And when that gets turned on, certain things in the body shift. So there's movement away from the center of the body and out to the extremities so that you can act. Uh, and, and so what, you know, your heart rate will, will be, your heart will beat faster. There's more oxygen flowing. Your pupils get bigger. There's more conversion of uh, glycogen to glucose. You're secreting adrenaline. And what we find is, is that the body then uh, doesn't want to digest and it doesn't actually produce enough ATP, which is important because that's like that's like the currency in the body that we need to do things within the cell. And what we found is is that people who are in a sympathetic dominance have less serotonin and are t tend to be more prone to depression. Now this is important and we'll understand in a minute why this is important. Uh, the parasympathetic is the opposite. That's the break. So when the body relaxes, you can begin to digest your food better. You slow down. Your heart slows down. 
So one is fight flight, that's the sympathetic. The parasympathetic is rest and digest. And we need both of these to function in the world. Now, unfortunately, most people are in sympathetic dominance, or many people are in sympathetic dominance. And so they have problems with digestion, they have problems with relaxing, sometimes they're anxious, sometimes they're depressed, sometimes their energy, interestingly enough, is low as a result of this. And, <clears throat> and so these are the two basic branches of the sympathetic nervous system. Now, where polyvagal theory comes in is that Dr. Porges talks about the vagus nerve and actually all of the, the nerves of the cranial base, the brainstem, there's, there's 12, he considers them intertwined. I would say that they're probably intertwined as well because what I find is when I'm working with people, either doing neurofeedback or brain spotting, in brain spotting, the eyes move, and I can do another topic on, on brain spotting, but the, the eye movements are controlled by cranial nerves. And so it's possible, and it seems to be, that they're intertwined with the vagus nerve. Now, the vagus nerve is important because vagal tone allows for proper function in various ways, including the parasympathetic nervous system. It will control breathing, it will control digestion, it can control pupil contraction. So that's why Dr. Poor just put this theory together. Now, anatomically speaking, we don't always see this, and this is where the controversy is. But when we think about this from a psychofunctioning viewpoint, it actually begins to make sense in a lot of ways. Okay, and then there's a third mode called freeze mode, which happens when a person is unable to act. And we see this with opossums, and you know, they're the, those creatures will play dead, and other animals think they're dead, so they leave them alone, and they're very good at it. So they, they're basically slowing their heart rate down, they're, they're looking like they're dead. The thing is, is as humans, when we go into freeze mode, generally we're in sympathetic mode before we go into freeze mode. And the analogy that people use is it's, it's as if a gazelle is being chased by a cheetah and it's about to get caught. Now, before it's, it's caught, it's running as fast as it can to get away from this cheetah. And, and that's requiring a sympathetic overload in a sense. And then when it's about to get caught or it is caught, it falls and it goes into freeze mode. Now, the freeze mode is created in nature so that an animal doesn't realize it's being eaten alive, which is very generous. But in a sense, you're still in sympathetic mode at the same time. And so when we look at this in human world, if you've had a traumatic experience, you're in, you may not look like you're in sympathetic mode, but because you're in freeze as a result of the trauma, but your body's stuck in the, in the sympathetic mode. And so the way out of this is sometimes to just feel the experience. Uh, you know, you just sort of sit with, oh, I'm feeling, I'm feeling this experience of, of being in, sympathetic in, 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 in this, ex, this freeze state. And I'll, I'll talk to this at, about this after the, after, at the end of the break. Okay. So how do we, how do we recognize the response? Well, if you're in fight or flight, you may feel knots in your stomach. You may be ready to strike. You may be, uh, you know, tightened in the jaw. If you're in flight mode, you may be anxious, you may, your eyes may dart looking for an escape, you may be restless, wanting to get out of this. And some people live their lives this way. And so they're not necessarily in freeze in this particular state. Now with freeze mode, you may feel stuck or numb or cold, but still breathe shallow. And you're, the difference is, is you'll have a decreased heart rate and there won't be very much heart rate variability. Okay, so let's take a quick break 
And at the end of the break, or at the, on the other side of the break, uh, I'm going to tell you about the course that I'm offering as well. So stay tuned. Okay, welcome back to Ask Dr. Gill. I'm Dr. Gil Winkleman, and today we've been talking about polyvagal theory and being in fight, flight, or freeze. And just to reiterate, you know, if you're in fight mode, you're ready to go. Like most people know when they're in fight mode, they want to punch something or someone. And that's something that is actually a good response. And I'm going to explain why this is important in a minute. Flight mode, you're ready to run and you may be breathing shallowly and you also may notice you're looking around, looking for an escape somehow. You may not be actually trying to escape, but that's the feeling, right? So, and then freeze, you're kind of stuck. You're numb, you're cold, but your heart rate is low, even though you're in a sympathetic response. So what do we do about this? Well, recognizing that there are three modes is the first thing that's important. And as you kind of sit with the experience, this is how you move through the trauma. Now, I want to reiterate, I want to be clear about something here. One does not have to relive nor remember the experience to work through it. I want to be really clear about that. And I think this is where psychotherapy has, in a sense, done a disservice to people. And, and not to say that it's wrong or bad per se, you know, I think it was just a misunderstanding that I don't think it's necessary to remember the experience to overcome the experience. Now, that doesn't mean that you won't remember it. It just means that you don't have to dig it up. And for some people, digging things up can be more damaging than just letting it lay there because you're in a sense reliving the trauma as you experienced it the other time. So, but I do think it is important to feel the experience and feel the, the trauma, if you will, in your body. And, and so I think that for many people, those two things are synonymous. In other words, if I feel the experience in my body, I remember the event that happened. And for other people, they're, they're not, you know, they're not uh, synonymous in a sense. They're, they're in a situation where you feel it in your body, but you don't know why you're feeling it. And that happens, I think, and this could be another topic for a podcast, but that happens because sometimes Trauma is something that is happened so long ago, it might be at a time where it was like pre-verbal, if you will. So you wouldn't necessarily be able to have a memory response to that. So, so there is that aspect of it. So what do you do? Well, the basic, the basic function that we're doing in these situations is we're feeling what is happening in our body as it's happening and <laughs> and breathing through it so you can experience the feeling and experience the tightness whether whether it's tightness in your jaw or the feeling that you want to run away or the stuckness whatever the feeling is that's what you you sit with and you watch it now, for some people, this can be anxiety pr producing, and sometimes it's better to do this with another person. And this is where the therapy is useful, like, you know, working with, with a professional around it. As you feel this experience, as you feel it, 
you're going to go through different things. So as we release the experience, you're going to feel potentially. So let's say you're in freeze mode, right? So you, you start to feel the stuckness. And as you feel it, you might feel your heart rate increase. Well, that, that's either the fight or the flight response. And you can go back and forth between those. And, 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 and as an example, you may want to punch the lights out of somebody as you're going through this. That is okay. Like just, to, just notice that. Just feel it. Just allow it. And at some point, you may start to shake. And that's a good response, by the way. Because that is the that is the energy. And the shaking is, you know, it's almost like a tremoring. That's the energy being released from the body. And for mo many people, once that starts to happen, that's when the nervous system then resets. So now... Uh, one thing I, of note that I want to say is that for many people, your memory of the event, if it does come, you may relive the event in a way that did not happen. And that is okay as well. So, for example, let's say that you got beat up as a kid and that's the trauma that you're remembering. Well, in you, as you're going through this experience, you may uh, re change the, the event and you beat the other people up. You defend yourself and beat, your, beat them up. And or you may run away and get away from them. That's okay. The body doesn't actually know the difference in a sense. And so as you re-experience re -experience the event and relive it in a way that's different, your body is is resetting itself. And that's the main thing that we're talking about because the freeze mode is a stuckness and the body can't get out of the sympathetic response, but you don't know that you're in the sympathetic response, if that makes sense. So, all right. So that's what I got for you today. I want to share with you that I'm offering two new courses that you can find out about on my website. The first one is a basic course that kind of goes through the differences in what an under and over methylator is called in the, because there's two term, the, the same term is being used in different ways. And so I want to discuss the methylation cycle and the epigenetic side of things. And the, that course is a basic course, and it will help you understand whether you need methylfolate or not, uh, for example. So the course that I'm off, the second course I'm offering is more comprehensive. And I'll cover the methylation cycle in, in, a, in more detail and epigenetics in more detail. And then I'll also go into other causes of anxiety and mental health issues, including what we just talked about in, in a slightly different manner. I also am going to talk about mitochondria, which probably are running the show and are very, very important. Inflammation uh, as well in one of the modules. And I'll also talk about testing and when testing and what tests are appropriate, as well as uh, the vitamins themselves. And I'm in including a cheat sheet so that if you take certain, certain vitamins, people seem to have more of a response to that is negative than others. Uh, folate for one, SAMe, um, B6, those are the big three that people tend to re respond poorly to. And my goal is to include a cheat sheet so that you know, or at least have some idea, uh, if you react to it, and depending on how you react to it, what the steps are in terms of either stopping it, adding something else, lowering the dose, those sorts of things. So, and uh, you can find more information about the courses on my website, askdrgill.com. And hopefully this was helpful for you. Uh, I will see you on...